Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Every Easter, it's the same story. The women rise early in the morning and head to the tomb. They don't find Jesus, but do find some angels who tell them that he has risen from the dead. The women go and tell the disciples, and they go and see for themselves, and everybody marvels at the miracle. Now clear on out, it's time for ham, colored eggs, jelly beans, and my favorite, that butter in the little shape of the lamb. The details between the Gospels differ a bit, each one offering a bit more information, but the core story is the same. Still, every Easter I notice something new in this Easter story. We Christians hear the resurrection account and think that we know all there is to know. We often do the same when it comes to Christmas, with Noah and the Ark, Daniel and the lion's den, all those big stories of the Bible. We've heard them so many times before that we have a tendency to gloss over the details. But continually I find that it's in those details that these stories really come to life. What struck me this year is what's reported in verses 10 and 11 in our Gospel reading for today. They read, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Did you catch that? The disciples, no, the apostles, these teachers of the faith, the great heroes of the faith that would go forth and spread the news of Jesus Christ throughout all the known world, didn't believe the message that the women told them about the resurrected Jesus Christ. And this is much more than a bunch of guys sitting back and saying, Oh gee, what are those ladies blathering on about now? No, Luke makes the point to tell us that these apostles considered what they had to say an idle tale. As in a fairy tale. Too fantastic to believe. It was too good to be true. As if they thought to themselves, Didn't you see him on the cross, ladies? You don't come back to life from that. Don't you remember how the centurion at his feet stuck the spear in his side and water and blood gushed out on the rocks below? Nobody can live after that. What a fairy tale. What nonsense. Well, I don't think that the disciples were stupid at all. I think they must have remembered Jesus' own words when he said to them on multiple occasions that he would be killed and would rise again in three days that he would be lifted up on the tree for all to see, that he would be destroyed, and then three days later, he would be alive again. I don't think they missed all of that. Jesus spent three whole years telling them all about it. So I have to conclude that their unbelief at the message of the women who went to the tomb was the result of something else. I suppose we might call it simply reality. There are copious amounts of reasons not to believe in fairy tale Jesus. You encounter them every day. Friends and neighbors, family members and famous people who all seem to get by just fine without this superstitious faith. You know the struggle of dealing with your own work schedule and your scarce days off, and sports and family time that have real tangible value over and again spending an hour in some church singing to some god in the sky that you can't even see. You're well aware of how science and smart people have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that all the stories in the Bible are nothing but historical fiction. After all, you saw it on the History Channel, for God's sake. <laughs> and let us not forget the internet, the archive of all things true and real which tell us that this story of Jesus is just an update of Anubis or Dagon or Mithras, that the Bible was made up by a bunch of old dudes in the Middle Ages. And how can you resist all of those snarky memes that your atheist friends post that really showcase the hypocrisy and the foolishness of all those silly Christians out there in the world? You know that world. That's the world in which we live. And many are swayed by that world, by that reality. Many don't believe. For the disciples, though, who lived during a time before the internet, before the History Channel, 
I imagine that the reality that caused their disbelief was something that was bigger, realer, and closer to you than your very own skin. In fact, it pervades every single cell of your body, and it's part of every single moment of your life from the time that you were conceived until the day that you take your very last breath. It's the reality of death. The disciples saw death in all of its gruesome glory on that cross at Calvary. Even those who came to see the spectacle and jeer at the accused went away from the hill that day, beating their own breasts for what they had done and for what they had come to see, asking them how they ever could have thought it was a good idea to go out and see it, lamenting to themselves that some things just can't be unseen. Walking away from that crucifixion, they probably realized in themselves that what they just witnessed, the heads of those accused men dropping, their hearts stopping, the breaths leaving their lungs, that that very same thing would come for them someday as well. And the stark reality of it is, it will come someday for you, just the same. Aren't you tired? Of living in a culture of death? Aren't you tired of living a life of death? Dear friends, there is much more to life than the reality of the world that offers us and sells to us every day. There is much more to human existence than consumption, procreation, and then death. Aren't you sick of that game? The getting ahead for today and perhaps tomorrow, all the while knowing that in the end, it's not going to really matter anyway, because you can't take any of it with you. That having a big house to live in and fill with stuff until that day that you become too old to make it up the stairs anymore, isn't the end all and be all of your life. That having your name on the side of some building isn't the best legacy that you can hope for. Or that leaving your kids a fat check when you check out is somehow supposed to make the death and dying thing a little bit better, that that's just a big stack of lies. Aren't you tired of the nonsense? Take all the things that the world out there says that we should value and put them into the context of our own mortality, and all of a sudden the lives that we are striving for seem like an idle tale. A ridiculous fantasy that, to be truth, I don't know that we really want to have anyway. Ask yourself, is this really the life that you are dying to have? I don't want that life. And yet, I catch myself chasing after it just about every day. We're surrounded by it, really. We see it every day. It's packaged to us and sold to us dressed up as success or importance, intelligence or happiness. But in the end, we know it's all empty. We know it in our hearts, and yet every cell in our bodies seems drawn to it in some sort of unhealthy, magnetic love of stuff in the world. And that's because this body of death is attracted to a culture of death. And they always, always want to be together. And this is precisely why Christ our Lord dives head first into death. This is why Christ takes on a very human body to accomplish our human redemption. This is why his resurrection from that death means absolutely everything to us. Christ is a fairy tale only to those who reject the reality of our human condition. But you, you know different. Because you know your sin and you know your death. You can feel it growing in you each and every day. So to you, having a man whose heart stopped beating, whose lungs stopped breathing, whose blood and water spilled out on the ground, and then after all of that, three days later, walked out of his own tomb alive and well, well, that means absolutely everything to you. It's no idle tale if it means that the very same thing will happen to you. Just imagine for a moment, what if it were true? What if you did indeed have a God who cared about you, 
who cared about your life, about your choices, about what you thought, said, and did? What if that very same God cared enough about you to plan for your eternal future, to provide and care for you even through the darkest times of your life? What if you had a God who would somehow accomplish a good purpose even through the worst of human tragedies and the most wicked of our own deeds? What if you had a God who knew your sin like they were his own? Who saw into the depth and evil and wickedness of your own heart and yet still found a reason to love you even more than before? What if you had a Savior who tasted death for you, conquered death for you, and then handed his victory to you to claim as your own? What if indeed you are immortal? with an eternity that is set before you? What if all the bad and tragic things of this life were but temporary circumstance and a perfected life, a perfection beyond compare, eternal life waited for you? What if all the terrible things that you've done and all the guilt that you carry around with you could be undone by this man? And what if this man were willing to do it completely and totally free of charge. Sound too good to be true? Sound like an idle tale? Perhaps, save for one simple, undeniable fact, that the same man who promised all these things to you also rose from the dead just as he promised. Which would you rather have? An earthly life full of stuff that leads to an eternal death without anything? Or an earthly death that leads to an eternal life full of all the blessings of our God? That choice is clear. And in Christ, that life is already yours. Christians are different from the world around us. What is presented to us as reality, we often see as falsehood. And that which we cannot see, by faith, we believe to be true. And it would all be foolish. We would be the most of anybody on the face of the earth to be pitied were it not for the simple fact of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. A scientific impossibility to be sure. A fairy tale ending, perhaps. But a fact, nonetheless. A man truly dead, like us, but living still, recorded by eyewitnesses, seen by hundreds at one time, seen by thousands over 40 full days, documented by history, believed by millions over thousands of years, and still true to this very day, and true for all eternity yet to come. And so we can say in confidence, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that because he lives, I will live also. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.